sermon today is entitled, A Brief History of Stubbornness. Okay, A Brief History of Stubbornness. And we are looking at a section in Deuteronomy um, where things are just about to happen. At least he's recounting how things are just about to happen. Okay, now, have you ever been on the edge of your seat waiting for something to happen? Have you? You have, right? We've all been there, right? Can you sit near the edge of your seat just for one moment? You're just on the edge of your seat, okay? And let's imagine, okay, but I won't make you actually do this. You are about to touch the top of the chair in front of you. I know the, the first row, you guys can't do this, okay? But you can just, okay? Now, when, but when I count to three, you're going to just tap the chair, the, the chair in front of you, okay? You guys ready? One, two, wait. Wait, not yet. Because I want to tell you grandfather's story first. <laughs> now that's what's happening in Deuteronomy chapter 9. So let's look at the text, right? This is, no, one thing you've got to know about Deuteronomy is just one of those books you just got to wrap. Okay, I'm just going to take this off. Right? You just got to wrap your head around the timeline just a little bit. Deuteronomy is like watching a documentary. I'm gobbling my words in this evening. Deuteronomy is like watching a documentary that contains film footage of newsreel from some time ago. And so, as you go through Deuteronomy, you're going to see references that go back to Exodus chapter 19, 20, 21, 22, and all those things, right? And that's the newsreel from like, let's say, the 1990s, right? That's like the newsreel from back then. And now, today, you're watching a modern-day documentary that contains newsreels from back then. That's what Deuteronomy is like, okay? So you're going to hear Moses talking now, present day. And then, that's you, on the edge of your seat, about to cross the Jordan, Right? And then suddenly he stopped and he said, I want to tell you Akong's story, right? And then suddenly the scene fades and then suddenly it becomes black and white and then you see from last time, last time Punya's story and then the old footage starts playing. And that's what Deuteronomy is going to feel like. At least that's what Deuteronomy's 9, 10, 11 do feel like. And so I'm going to bring you in now to Deuteronomy chapter 9 uh, right at the start. Listen, Israel, present day. Present day, okay? The, the documentary, okay? Listen, Israel. Today, somebody say today. Today, you are about to cross the Jordan to enter and drive out nations greater and stronger than you. Hey, that's quite... That's quite edge of your seat stuff, right? Today, you know. Not tomorrow, you know. Not next week, you know. This is like the morning of Malam Pentecostal, the morning of 25th anniversary, the morning of, of, of reopening church after lockdown. Today, you are about to cross the Jordan to enter and drive out nations greater and stronger than you with large fortified cities to the heavens. The people are strong and tall. The descendants of the Anakim, you know about them. And you have heard it said about them, who can stand up to the sons of Anak. But understand that today, Yahweh your God will cross over ahead of you as a consuming fire. He will devastate and subdue them before you. You will drive them out and destroy them swiftly as Yahweh has told you. And now, it's still on today. And then he says this, this is Moses speaking to the nation of Israel. When Yahweh your God drives them out before you, do not say to yourself, by the way, you'll see it's rendered, I've rendered the Lord's name as, uh, as, as the, the four letters, Yahweh, okay? Um, if, you, if your Bible renders it as, as the Lord with capital L-O-R-D, the Hebrew says this, okay? And the difference between the two, it, it means the same thing, but in terms of feel, the difference is a little bit like saying, your father loves you and papa loves you. That's the only difference, okay? And so, and so it's just a personal thing. I like to render it with the original Hebrew name. That's all, okay? When Yahweh your God drives them out before you, and He will, right? That's His promise. When Yahweh does it, do not say to yourself, oh, Yahweh brought me in to take possession of this land because of my righteousness, 
Because I'm so good. Because we are SIVKL. Because we're so fantastic. It's like, no, 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 no. When, when you see supernatural things happening, like when you see David's defeating Goliath, so to speak, but this is much l- uh, earlier before that, when you see underdogs defeating top dogs, it's not because you're so great, right? You are not going in to take possession of their land because of your righteousness or your integrity. Right? I'm skipping a, little few, a few verses, there are a few details. I just want you to really see this. Understand that Yahweh your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness. Three times the emphasis, for you are a stiff-necked people. Wow. Well, talk about, talk about cutting, uh, cutting of people's ego, right? It's like, just so you know, uh, if you win, uh, it's not because they're so great. Actually, you're stiff-necked people. Burn, so much burn, Moses, so much burn, right? Of course, stiff-necked is an expression rendered in some of your English translations as stubborn, right? And then he starts to show you the newsreel from the past. In order, to, in order to justify why he's telling them, you actually are stiff neck fellas. Don't think you're so grand, right? Remember this and never forget how you aroused the anger of Yahweh your God in the wilderness. The old news reel is playing. From the day you left Egypt until you arrived here, you have been rebellious against Yahweh. At Horeb, everybody say Horeb. At Horeb, you aroused Yahweh's wrath so that he was angry enough to destroy you. And then he tells the story, the news real plays. And what is that story? If you have a church background, you will know this story. If you are new to church, as some of our new visitors are new to church, you know, a big hello if you're new to church, right? Then I will give you a simplified version of that story. Moses is leading the whole nation of Israel. Right? How many hundred thousand? Is it four or six hundred thousand, Isaac? I, I, it just slips my mind. I think it's six hundred thousand. Six, right? Yeah, six. Six hundred thousand people wandering around the desert lands, okay? And Moses is their leader. And then Moses has an appointment with God up on a mountain. The mountain is called Sinai, right? And at the base, it's called Horeb. That's where they're at. Moses leaves them there. He goes up. He spends 40 days up there before the Lord. Meanwhile, the mountain is quaking with fire and smoke because the presence of Yahweh their God is there. And everyone on the ground can see this. And Moses goes up 40 days, 40 nights. Now, we don't know whether in those 40 days, 40 nights, the fire continued quaking or not. We only know that they should have seen enough to know to take this God quite seriously. And then after 40 days, they say to among themselves, hey, where's this Moses guy? Huh? Very long already. Leh. See now, ah, this guy. Not coming back. Ah. He took a walk, is it? Hey, if this Moses guy, ah, if he from us, ah, we're doomed, man. We don't know this God, you know. We don't know anything, you know. Wow, they are like that. How, how, how? They look around among each other and then they turn to Aaron. And Aaron, not, uh, not this Aaron, right? Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they turn to, to Moses' brother Aaron and they say to him, how? And then Moses' brother Aaron says, okay, all your gold jewelry, you give me, right? He's like, what? No, no, no. See, I got a plan, right? They give all the gold jewelry and, uh, and then he melts it down. If you, were, if you know a bit about China history, in the 1940s, is it 40s or 50s, Mao Zedong had the backyard furnace great leap forward uh, where they took all of their jewelry and they melted it down to turn into bullets. It was a ridiculous economic plan. It massively failed. This one massively failed too. So the next time someone asks you for your jewelry to melt down in a backyard furnace, don't give, okay? It's, 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 it's always a stupid plan, okay? <laughs> give me your gold and they melted it down, okay? And as Aaron said later, out came this calf, right? It's like they melted it down, boop! A calf came out, right? A molten calf made out of gold jewelry, melted down. And then they say that, oh, this is our God. And then they put the thing here on top and then they start dancing and celebrating and worshipping this thing, 
right? And then they start saying, God is here. Oh, finally, we got someone to lead us out of this place. And they, the entire nation, at least thousands of them, go into revelry, right? They are, they, are, they are dancing, celebrating worship, a little bit like this, except that their object of worship is not Yahweh. Their object of worship was that thing, right? And and they go on like that. Meanwhile, Moses on the mountain has been warned this is going to happen. He comes down with the Ten Commandments on two stone tablets, okay, written on both sides. So we always imagine it's like five and five. Actually, it's more like two and then three and then two and then three, right? Because it's like, okay. And then he comes down. He sees this act of idolatry and unfaithfulness. It's a bit like walking in on your friend, you know, in their bedroom and they're not with their spouse but someone else. It's like, what? You know? And in his wrath, and Moses is, 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 is a guy to be, you know, to give in to his anger once in a while, right? He slams the, 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 the tablets on the floor and breaks them. In, do, doing, in doing so, he breaks all Ten Commandments in, in one go, right? <laughs> He, he, and then he scolds them. He takes a golden calf. He smashes it up. Okay, he bancho it into water. And then he makes them all drink it. Okay, I think that's like, wow, this is really chialat. Okay, he makes them all drink it, scolds them all properly. And so Moses tells his story. That's the story. That, that's, the, that's the golden calf story, right? And so he's telling them, you know, be careful. Because in Horeb, that's what you did. And when you did that, you aroused God to such a level of anger, he really wanted to destroy you. Like right there and then, he really wanted to destroy you. And in a moment, we are going to look a little bit into the first and then the second and third and fourth and fifth of a brief history of Israel's stiff-neckedness in the years wandering in the desert. Let's go back to the slide. Verse 22, I've jumped a little bit, right? Because he's still going to play back more old news reels, okay? The old news reel sounds like this. You also made Yahweh angry at Tabera. Somebody say Tabra, right? At Masa, say Masa. Not Masa College, no, it's a different Masa, okay? At Kibroth Hata'ava. Wow, you all don't want to say this, right? Okay, I actually listen to, to YouTube to hear how people say it. It's Kibroth Hata'ava, right? And when Yahweh sent you out from Kadesh Barnea, He said, go up, take possession of the land I've given you. But you rebelled against the command of Yahweh your God. You did not trust Him or obey Him. You have been rebellious against Yahweh ever since I have known you. And so, my friends, I'm going to show you, I'm going to take you down five stages. Now, here's the thing. Stubbornness is one word. And we always imagine stubbornness is this one thing. It's this one thing. Stubbornness is like, you know, just stubborn. Oh, it's stubborn for us, stubborn, you know. We only have one picture for stubbornness. But actually, in this Deuteronomy chapter 9, stubbornness comes in five different faces. And I'm going to show you how stubbornness actually looks like five different things. And then you tell me whether you see some of yourself in it. I can tell you I do see some of myself in it. And so, as I share this with you, I do so with quite a lot of fear of God and a bit of trembling and humility because I really do see quite a lot of myself in it sometimes, right? And so, stubbornness, what's the opposite of stubbornness, uh, actually? Obedience, obedience. If, if I was growing up in my hometown with my Hokkien father uh, uh, describing to me what's the opposite of stubbornness, stubbornness punya opposite is a kiasi, right? A kiasi means scared, to, scared of dying, yeah. In other words, it's have some kind of reverential fear. Right? Some kind of fear of the stakes. You, 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 you are able to, you know, when Hawking people say, you, this fellow, boy, can I see? What it really means huh, is that this fellow does not know how to weigh out the stakes and apply some kind of appropriate level of fear to that situation. That's what boy, can I see really means, right? Okay? And so the opposite of stubbornness is boy, can I see, right? Okay? Anything also like, oh, don't care, don't care, don't care, don't care. You know? So, well, how really? Really? We're going to see that in a moment. And so, if you turn to the slides, I'm going to show you five of them. The first one is Horeb, right? The first one is Horeb, the golden calf incident. Now, I've told you the story. I don't need to go into it again. But here's what's happening at Horeb. The people grew impatient. 
they, was, they started to ask themselves, what's happening with Moses? Is he coming down? Is he not coming down? And then they started to get restless. And then they started to feel like, I got to do something. I got to do something about this. Now, you know what? Honestly, I wrestled with whether I'm going to write there impatience or idolatry. Because on the surface, it could be idolatry. Now, in, in many ways, idolatry is, maybe it's like the outcome of the impatience. So maybe it's quite fitting that I'm sharing it from this angle today on a Saturday. Because if you come back on, uh, 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 for the 11 o'clock, Pastor Isaac is going to go into the golden calf more. And he's going to be able to unpack a lot more stuff about the idols uh, that we have in our lives. And I, and, and I think you, all of us should, should, should have a chance to hear that as well. So please do, okay? Please do. Even if you can't show up here, tune in online, right? Now, um, I think that what's happening in the people before idolatry, I don't think they woke up one day and just in a very calm, serene way say like, hey, you know what, guys? Let's start worshipping gold, gold jewelry. Let's do that. Yeah, okay, chill. Let's do it, you know? I think that anxiety kicked in. And when anxiety kicks in, then sweat starts to drop. And then they start to think like, you yeah, cannot already, lah, cannot already, lah, long already, lah, uh, yeah, how, uh, uh, yeah, how, uh? and then panic, uh, and then like that, uh, and, then they, and then their breath starts to grow shorter, and they start to speak faster, like Pastor Fergus, they start to speak really fast, and then after that, they cannot tahan anymore, and then they have to do something about it, so they oh, give me all my gold, let's melt it down, let's worship this thing, and then they, and that's what they do, right? That's what, that's what impatience does to you. When you become impatient, you become anxious and you make bad choices. And I want to share this with all of us. Sometimes we are impatient too. And we're not just impatient with other people. I think, I think when you say, hey, are you impatient? Yeah, yeah, I'm impatient with my children. You know, like, go to sleep already, right? Like, come on, man, it's like 10 o'clock. What are you doing tomorrow? 9 o'clock, call time, you know? Um, sometimes, sometimes we're impatient with each other. But you know something? Maybe sometimes we're impatient with ourselves. And maybe God is speaking to you, saying that I want you to go through a journey of growing, a journey of maturing, a journey of going through something that could feel like fire, but don't worry, you will not die by it because I'm leading you through it. And as He leads you into it and the first sense of heat comes and you say, ah, the one, the one. And then you get nervous and you just start to like, oh, what can I do, what can I do, what can I do? You know, like, like God has told me to do. Uh, uh, um, yeah. and, then you, and then you act. You, you, you press the panic button, you do something, and then you act out of turn. And maybe God is saying to you that, hey, have you seen what it looks like when my people are impatient? They get nervous, they get anxious, and bad judgment clouds them because they are no longer making decisions out of faithfulness, they are making decisions out of fear. And he's saying, be patient. I am a patient God. I am slow to anger. I'm not going to whip you. I'm not going to kill you. Those are the gods of the other lands. I'm not like that. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to grow you. So church, are you impatient with your own growth? Are you impatient with your own goals? Are you impatient with your own development? Are you impatient with your own walk with God? Do we sometimes give you the feeling that you should be impatient with yourself? If we do, we don't mean it. But really, I think, if anything, your pastors will be patient with you. As your pastors, we want to be patient with you. We want to spur you on so that every time you stumble, every time we stumble, that one of us is going to lift us up and say, come on, let's keep going. Come on, let's keep going. God is still working on you. Why? Because He who began a good work will bring it to completion. And that's not just true of the Old Testament. That is a New Testament Bible scripture, by the way. He who began a good work will bring it to completion. It's from Philippians 1 verse 6. That's for a different era of Christians. It still applies. And I just want to share this one little thing here, okay? A lot of the times, we're going to look into Deuteronomy. We're going to look at the nation of Israel. And we're going to treat them a little bit like a circus freak show. 
And you know what it looked like about 200 years, 100 years ago when a circus rolls into town? They will have like a giant cage and like a huge cloth over it and they will say, uh, uh, um, someone with a hat or something like that, oh, I present to you the monstrous, you know, bearded woman from, you know, um, I don't know, Banteng or something like that, right? And they're going to lift the thing and there's going to be someone in there who looks different from all of us and everyone's going to go like, ah! And then like so freaky, you know, and everyone like stands and gawks and freaks out. But then they, it's so horrifying, they have to look, but they cannot look. And then, and then people stand around what we think are freak shows. And then we stand, we gawk, and we say, oh, lucky I'm not like them. And then we walk away to the next freak show, side show, right? And sometimes we can end up doing that to the Israel in Old Testament, you know? We can read an account like this and say like, you, why they're like that one, ah? so not faithful one, ah? so obvious. What they, who, who would actually you know, melt down their gold and turn it into a calf and then worship it? It's so obvious. If I was there, I would have worshipped Yahweh. Right? And then we stand and gawk at Israel and say that, you, I would never be like that. And then you, you're going to see more. I got four for you today. Four more for you today, right? But no, you know what? Lenses, lenses, right? Today, I want all of us to wear the lens that, you know what, this could be me. This could be me. Because, you know what, if you looked at that bearded woman from Banting, right, and you took the time to gaze into her face and gaze into her eyes and see her shame and see her entrapment and see her pain and see her loneliness and see her abuse and you see her cry behind those bars, you realize that she's more like you than she's, like, than she's not like you. And if we take the time to gaze into the eyes of Israel and we're really humble with ourselves, we will realize too that actually they are more like us than we give ourselves credit for. And, and that's a good lens to wear as we read Deuteronomy. Okay? And so, on that note, let us remember, at the first, one of the ways, stubbornness comes in many faces, Right? But the opposite of stubbornness is to fear the Lord, right? The opposite of stubbornness is to fear, have the reverential fear. So the first face that stubbornness can wear is impatience. Impatience and then you act on your own decisions. You act on your own wisdom. We've seen it in King Saul, right? I can go on riffing. I can go on riffing. I, I promise I wouldn't go long today, right? Let's, let's, let's look at this slide. In Horeb, stubbornness looked like impatience. And then, they went to Tavera, right? And in Tavera, they were caught complaining. Complaining, and of course, the reference, the newsreel is Numbers 11, right? And so this week, I spent so much time in Numbers 11 and so little time in Deuteronomy 9 that I got confused what text I was preaching, okay? So in Tavera, they, they were complaining about their hardship. That's what the text says. Go to Numbers 11, go look at it, right? It says that at Tavera, they were complaining about their hardship. And then God got so angry with them that He sent a fire and the fire burnt up the outskirts of their camp. And I was like, hey God, quite an overreaction, right? Complain about hardship also cannot. Ah. Wow, tialat man. Diamond, who got chance? Who stands a chance here, right? Now, in Sungai Buloh Church, I just took my guys through four weeks of the Psalms. And we spent one week on the Psalms of lament. And then we spent one more week on the Psalms of vengeance and justice. Hey, those two, those two weeks accumulate to something like, what, some 30%, 40% of all the Psalms in the 150 Psalms. And it's all like angry complaining. And then, how come you didn't strike them down, Leh? You know? This cannot be. It cannot be just about the com complaining about the hardship. It cannot be because, because my Bible tells me that if you are going through hardship, you can cry about it. If my Bible teaches me that if you're going through a really, really bad time, you can go before God and cry and cry and cry and you can lament about it and you can even get angry about it and he's not, he is not so sensitive that he's going or easily offended that he's going, you, 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 you say these things at me, you know, like I burn up the outskirts of your camp, right? So I, I thought, no, 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 the Tabera issue looks a little bit like there's more to it 
than it seems. And so I started reading uh, Numbers 10, the chapter before that, and I realized that just before the incident at Tabera, that it reaffirms the way in which they were travelling. They were being led every day by a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. And every day they were being led in the supernatural way. They had just come out of Egypt. The seas had just parted for them. They have just been set free as a people. They are a nation being born anew, but they weren't being born on their own. God, their God Yahweh, was showing them through supernatural miracles miraculous leadership every day. Can you imagine being led by a pillar of fire every day? Like, is that not ridiculously awesome and mind-blowing, right? And that's leading you every day. You're, every day you are a witness to supernatural leadership. Every day you are a witness to following something which is lua biasa. And that, that, my friends, that to be able to witness something so incredible and then turn around and complain and complain and say, you know what, this, this is bad, this is stupid, this I wish we were back there, right? And I think it's out of something like that, out of the combination of being led so supernaturally and still to be so negative and complainy that God burnt up the outskirts of their camp. How do I know this? Revelation chapter 12, we're swinging all the way to the end of our Bibles. Revelation chapter 12 says that how shall you defeat the enemy? How shall you defeat Satan who is the accuser, who accuses you all day, all night, all day, all night? He accuses you of every false accusation. How shall you defeat him? Two things. The blood of the Lamb and the word of your witness. The word of your testimony. You, have, you can testify because you have witnessed. You can testify because you have seen. You can testify. You have a word. You, can, you have a word. You can say, my God is good. My God is good because I have seen him being a good God. I have seen his mighty hand and his outstretched arm. I have seen his great things. I have seen him move. And that testimony, believe it or not, under the power of the blood of the lamb that was slain, destroys Satan, the accuser. And so, my friends, your witness is a weapon to destroy Satan. And so your witness is there to embolden you, to strengthen you, to give you armour, to help you defeat dark powers that are more evil than you can ever imagine. Your witness has power to bring about order, to bring about, to help those who are weak so that if Satan is accusing a weak person, that your witness can break that chain of accusation and set captives free. Your witness is powerful. Their witness was that every day they followed a supernatural power, a light, a fire, a pillar, going around. And still, in spite of that, their witness yielded nothing. Their witness yielded complaints. Complaint letter after complaint letter. That's what their witness yielded. And I believe that's what got, got God so furious. And I think yet he was merciful. He didn't set the fire from the middle of the camp. He burnt up the outskirts of the camp as if to say, guys, I'm going to stop here. You guys better stop here. You better stop here. Because stubbornness comes in many faces. But the opposite of stubbornness is to fear the Lord. And he is saying, God is saying, fear me. Fear me, not because I want to do harm to you, therefore you should fear me. Fear me because if you do not fear me, then you are going to step into all of these things which are going to bring you in the path of harm. God forbid. Amen? And so it is for yourself. In fact, it says somewhere in the text, and I don't have it on the slide, it is for your own good. It's for your own good that you, that you fear the Lord. Not even for Him. It's for your own good that you fear the Lord. Now let's move on. We have seen Horeb, and the problem in Horeb was impatience. We have seen Tabera. The problem in Tabera was complaining, or rather, maybe a more accurate way to say it is that, that their witness did not yield anything. Instead, it yielded complaining, right? And the next step was Masa. Now, Masa was the place where they were thirsty. 
They were thirsty enough to be fair. They are traveling around a barren wasteland. And they are thirsty. Would you be thirsty? I would be thirsty. I told the PM just now, uh, brother, I don't need a bottle of wine. I'm fine. Now I'm thirsty. That's stupid, right? No, don't worry about it. I'm fine. <laughs> when you're thirsty, you ask for water, right? Yeah. Right? No, actually, when you're thirsty, you go and quarrel with your boss. That's what you do, right? Because that's what they did, right? That's what they did. And so their problem at Massa was that they quarreled with Moses. And they didn't go to Moses and say, Moses, wow, ao tao, house bro, machamana bro, right? Can pray to God and ask him to send water? Can or not, right? No, they went to Moses and said, you lah, every day lah. Bring us out here to die, lah. Ah, yeah. I tell you, ah, last time when we were in Egypt, ah, da, 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 and then they start quarreling with Moses real proper. Kasi, kasi, kasi. And God was so angry. And yet, in his anger, God gave them an out. Nah. He told Moses, you go and then, you know, uh, strike, strike the stone with, and then the water will flow. And by the way, if in case you're suddenly now confused, there, is a, there are two occasions of this. There's a second occasion where God brings Moses there. He says, this time, speak to the rock. And then Moses struck the stone instead. And then there's a whole different story on its own. Okay? But in Massa, first account, he tells him, strike the stone. Water comes out, they drink. But God was so angry. In fact, his anger at Massa, and then the place called, became to be called Meribah, okay? Mas, his anger at Massa and Meribah gets referenced back throughout the rest of your Bible as well. So Masa and Meribah comes back again and again. So what is the problem there, right? Because I told you, stubbornness comes in many shapes and forms. But the opposite of stubbornness is fear the Lord. So what is the form, the face of stubbornness at Masa? It is the spirit of quarrelling. Like to fight. Small things also fight. Everything also fight. Hey, hello. Did not the Apostle James say that you don't have because what? You don't ask, right? You don't have because you don't ask. Actually, what happens is that when you desire, go check me out, right? It's James chapter 4, verse 2, verse 2, 3, around there. He says that you covet and then you quarrel. It's like that, right? You desire for things and then you murder each other for it. You covet and then you quarrel with one another. That's exactly what happened. So guess what? The disciples under the tutelage of the Apostle James in Jerusalem, and then and with like thousands of years before that, to the to, to, to the Israel, you know, at Massa, so similar. Why? Because they coveted water and they quarreled with one another, right? And God is saying, No, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. We are Christians with a God who says to you, you think I'm such a bad God, such a stingy God, right? No. He says, I am a good father. If you, not perfect fathers, if your son asks you for bread, you won't give him a stone. If your son asks you for fish, you won't give him a snake. How much more will I give you good things if you ask for it? So, ask for it, but don't turn it into a fight. Now, my church, sometimes we, in our hunger and thirst and passion and zeal, we go down the path of fighting for it rather than asking for it. We fight for it first. No need to ask, fight only, fight for it, argue, quarrel for it first. And God says, no, no, you know what? You don't have because you didn't ask. Ask and you shall receive. Now, and then he goes on, James goes on to say, and sometimes you ask, you don't receive because you ask out of your own passionate lusts and out of your own, out of your own sinful appetites, right? And that's, that's why sometimes you ask and you don't receive. There's a different story altogether. Here, what they wanted was entirely legitimate. Just water to quench the mouth. Ask. They should have just asked. Instead, they quarrel. And so, my friends, stubbornness comes in many shapes and forms at at Horeb, it came in the form of impatience, right? In Tabera, it came as a form of complaining. In Massa, as quarreling. And then in Kibroth Hata'ava, it came in the form of their appetites. And so what happens in Kibroth Hata'ava is this. They said, wow, 
vegetarian very long already. Not very cool. 40 days FNP. I cannot tahan anymore. And they say, it's been a long time since we had meat. And maybe if they had just said, can I have meat? Asthma, right? But they didn't, no, right? Okay, they didn't. They started grumbling and complaining and saying, wow, we should have meat. We should have meat. Wow, why no meat? Wow, rawr. And then like, you know, all that stuff comes out. And you know what? God said, you really want meat? You really want meat? Now, this part is challenging for me. Huh? God says, you really, really, really want meat so much that you act like this. It's like the kid who in, the, in Toys R Us flops onto the floor and starts doing the helicopter like, eh, I'm not going to go home until you buy for me, right? Like, have you all seen those kids? Have you all seen those kids in Toys R Us? You have. I see some of you all nodding. It's not your kids. It's someone else's kid. I don't know, right? right? And God is saying like, you really, really, you will flop onto the floor and do helicopter circles it's just so you can eat meat. It's your lust for your appetites so controlling you that you will go to this extent. And they, now, this is my own sanctified imagination. It might be a little bit overdramatic, but they, at this point, Israel goes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, now, God says, fine, I'll send you meat. I'll send you quail. I'll send you so much quail. Um, scholars are not sure whether they died and piled up three feet high or that they flew to the height of three feet high so that they were easily caught. But the point is, he sent them so much quail, so much quail that God promised them if you ate all this quail, you would, be, you would stuff yourself so much it would be oozing out of all your bodily orifices. That's how much meat you're going to eat. But God's being sarcastic. He's, that does not actually mean that they're going to eat all that meat. You know why? Because they're like, oh, song already, Lord, right? Take the, take the quail, cook the quail, eat the quail. But just as they were about to bite into the quail, God sent a plague. And then some scholars say, oh, it's the quail meat that made them sick. No, I don't think so. I think God sent a plague, right? I think God sent a plague. And the plague destroyed, I think it was some 3,000 people uh, um, who were the ones helicoptering and, and, and making very childish demands um, for something. Now, now is, it, is it too much to ask? I, I, I've been asking myself, like, every station of stubbornness, I ask myself, I look so much like that. Is it too much to ask? Meet ma, it's okay ma, right? And then God says, maybe it's the way they went about asking. Okay, fine, maybe it's the way they went about asking. You know, and, and I say that, God, is there more to it than this? And he said, don't you remember what the Apostle Paul said? Well, well, he said a lot of things, God. <laughs> you, don't, you don't do this to me, right? He said a lot of things. He said, Philippians 4, that famous verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's like, okay, oh yes. Oh yes, by the way, in case you didn't know and you use that verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You use that verse for going for your football match, you know, or going for your badminton final, or you, or, you do, or you use that when you go for a job interview, you know, and you say, yes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, you know. Not the most accurate use of that Bible verse, huh? because that Bible verse actually says this. I have lived a long life and I have learned the secret of being contented. I have lived in abundance and I have lived in scarcity. I have been well fed and I have gone very hungry before. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the context, okay? And so God reminded me, Fergus, don't you remember that that's the posture I'm looking for from my people? Not helicoptering, demanding for some meat, but that's the posture. You see, Paul, I can do all things in much and less in blessings and in scarcity, in rich and poor, for riches or poor, for in good health and in sickness, and all you married people say, yes, no wonder they made me make those vows, right? In sickness or in health, in much or less, in abundance or scarcity, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I will not, in scarcity, start acting like an overgrown child, demanding to have every single thing I want and then I start throwing all the, prams out, all the toys out of the pram, right? No, God says, no, that's not the right way. That's not spiritual maturity. I'm raising you to be a nation. For goodness sake, I'm raising you to be a nation. You are going to be a light to the whole world. You can't act like kids anymore. 
I'm raising you to be mature followers of Yahweh. You are going to be what? They are going to see me through th- by seeing you. And so if they see you and you are helicoptering in Toys R Us, that's not me. And I can't bless that, says the Lord. And so he says, it makes a difference how you act. It makes a difference that my Christians act like mature, spiritual reflectors of their God. And if they don't, and then he got angry lah, at Masala, you know? And maybe we should maybe put a mirror in front of ourselves and think again about how sometimes we are stubborn. Because stubbornness comes in many shapes and forms. Impatience at Horeb. In Tabera, it was being quarrelsome, right? In, uh, in Masa, it was being, it, it was being uh, uh, not, not just thirsty, but sorry, thirsty and quarrelsome, right? In Tabera, it was, it was not appreciating the, 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 the supernatural witness that they've had. And then now in number four, it is, uh, no, I'm going to need the slides for this, right? My brains are everywhere now. Um, in number four, in Kivra Hata'ava, it was the appetite, their lust for life, right? Uh, um, and then he moves them to the final one. And I'm going to close somewhat soon, right? Uh, um, the final one is in Kadesh Barnea. And this, after one, after one station of stubbornness to another, to another, to another, he brings them to the point where they are literally... A short distance. And then he says, you're going to go in. And he sends spies. If you don't have a Bible background, it's okay. He sends 12 spies. One from each subsection of their community. They're called tribes, right? He sends 12 spies in. Two spies come back and says, gosh, this land is crazy. The grapes are this big. The things are this big. And God will give it to us. This is crazy good. Two spies came back with that kind of report. You see the perspective? Another 10 spies came back and said, Gosh, this is bad news, guys. The grapes are this big. If the grapes are this big, then imagine the finger of the people who pluck the grapes must be this big. And the finger that puts into the grape into the mouth must be that big. The mouth must be this big. And imagine these giants must be incredibly big. Sure die one. Sure die. Don't go in. Sure die, right? And that's the wrong kind of kiasi, by the way. That's the wrong kind of kiasi, right? And then 10 spies say, don't go. Two spies say, God will give. Go. And the whole nation said, I think those 10 spies are saying something or don't know. Scary or sure die or and then they, they said, do I know? Do I, do I go? After journey for so long, he said, do I go? And God says, here at Kadesh Barnea, here at Kadesh Barnea, you made me angriest. Angriest. Because I've shown you one thing after another, after another, after another, after another, and you still so near, so near. And you refuse to step forward. You don't trust me. You don't trust me. You trust those 10 spies. You don't trust me. I'm going to bring you in and give you victory. And you don't trust me. At Kadesh Barnea, their stubbornness. Let's look at the slide. At Kadesh Barnea, you know what? A whole lifetime journey of stubbornness matured into full-blown rebellion. And from there on, he never speaks about Kadesh Barnea as stubbornness alone. He always speaks of it as rebellion. You, the day you rebelled at Kadesh Barnea. The day you rebelled at Kadesh Barnea. You know what, my friends? I'm not preaching an angry sermon today, so don't worry. I'm sharing with you guys that the end point of seeing a journey like this has to be the fear of God. The end point of a journey like this has to be that we grow a reverential fear, a reverential kia of God, right? A reverential respect, honour, regard, so that we can say, God, if you say, I'll do. If you say, I'll do. Why? Because in Deuteronomy chapter 10, it says, And now, Israel, what does Yahweh your God ask you, ask of you, except to... Fear Yahweh your God 
by walking in all His ways. To what? Love Him. To worship Yahweh your God with all your heart and all your soul. Keep Yahweh's commandments and statutes that I am giving you today. For whose good? For your good. And so, my friends, the brief history of stubbornness must end with the people saying, here I bow. A story of a people wrestling with God and their own fears, wrestling with God and their own impatience, wrestling with God and their own, their own quarrelsomeness. And we all have that, right? I told you, right? Lens, they, they are us and we are like them, right? With their own appetites. Some of you are at a juncture in your life I'm not talking about small things. Some of you are at a juncture of your life. You're making major financial decisions because of your appetite for high living. And if you can afford it, it's okay. It's fine, right? But if you're going out of your means and you're stretching things and you're putting the, 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 the longevity of some of your more important priorities under the risk, and maybe today you had to hear this. Maybe today you had to hear what happened you know, at Kibroth Hatha'ava so that you can put your, our, we can put, we can put our appetites for the good things in life into their rightful perspective. And if you can still afford it, go ahead, right? But maybe you can't. And maybe we want to pick, a, pick, pick an issue with something and to us it's righteous anger. And to us it's righteous uh, 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 um, uh, cause. He said, God, the Bible, a lot of people take up, fight, what? they fight, what? they fight enemy, they fight, you know, darkness. Yes, they do. And maybe God is saying, can you come to me first? Can, maybe the day will come when I, I send you to fight a cause. But can you come to me first and ask and be patient with me and be patient with yourself as I shape you to become the kind of person who can carry the torch into darkness? And maybe you are overstimulated and maybe you are over-expecting yourself to get everything right by the time you are like, whatever, 32 or whatever. How, what, how old do we expect ourselves to peak these days? I don't know. And God is saying, no, I want you to be patient. No, He says, I want you to ask me before you fight with people. He says, no, I don't want you to quarrel and I, don't want, and I want you to keep your appetites for the good things in life in perspective and under self-control because that's one of the nine fruit of the Spirit. Self-control. And patience, by the way, is one more. And he says, don't fear the one who can kill your body but cannot touch your soul. Because if you walk from here to here and you actually listen to the testimony of those two spies, you would have gotten in there way earlier. And, you, and if you decided, I will not fear those people who can kill me, but they cannot touch my soul. Greater is he who can kill me and take my soul. That's God. That's, that's their God, Yahweh. And he says, fear me. Don't fear them. Fear me. And he says, but I don't want to kill you and take your soul. I want to bring you into a land, a land rich, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land where the grapes are yay big, right? A, a land that you will call your own. And I want to bring you there. But you were stubborn. You refused. And so Moses says, end of my grandfather's story. And then he stops the old news reel. And you're back in present day. He says, today is your second chance. Your grandfather's failed you. Today is your second chance. Don't fail your grandchildren now. I went through all these things. 
All these grandfather stories, for what? To tell you that today you're going to march in. Today you're going to take territory. Today the Lord will go ahead of you. Today, I don't care how big their things are, God is bigger than all of them. And He's going to go in and He's going to trample down every spiritual power of darkness and He's going to pave a way for light to enter darkness. Today He's sending you into victory. And you are at the same distance to victory as your grandfathers were. Don't fail the next generation now. That's what Deuteronomy 9, 10, and 11 is all about. And so, how shall we respond? Stubbornness comes in many shapes and faces. But the opposite of stubbornness is here I bow to lift you high. The opposite of stiff-neckedness is Jesus. Be glorified. I follow you. I bend my knee and worship you. I bend my knee and obey you. I bend my knee and call you my Lord, my God. I follow you. I love you. I fear you. I all these things you because you are my God and you have my full allegiance. You have my full allegiance and trust. I am yours forever. What? Yours. So let's rise and worship. Let's rise and worship. Oh, church, if any of you feel like you want to go to and take a knee for Jesus, please just, just make some room, you know, uh, um, and take a knee for Jesus. But if not, then throw your hands up and declare to Him, Here I bow to lift you high. Amen. Let's worship. I know we're all standing, our eyes are closed. If you are wrestling with any one of those five things that we shared today, no one looking around, I'm not going to ask you to step out. But if you are wrestling with any one of those five things, I want you to slowly, discreetly just put your hand on your heart. I've got my hand on my heart. And I want you to say to the Lord, Lord, Teach me to fear you. Teach me to not fight you, but teach me to fear you because you are a good God. And God knows I need to trust you more. Lord, you know I need to trust you way more. Teach me to trust you. Teach me to fear you. Teach me to love you more. But church, I think we all think we, we, we know how to love God, but maybe we don't know how to fear Him. So hand on your heart. I want you to say a prayer before the Lord right now in your own words so you can hear yourself. Say, Lord, help me to love you. Help me to fear you. I'm standing here before you. Give me a soft heart. I want to stop fighting. I really want to stop fighting, Lord. I've no energy. It's so painful. It's so tiring. I want to stop fighting with you. I want to fear you. And I want to bend my knee before you. However you want to lead me, I take, I accept, I follow. Right here, on this Saturday afternoon, I covenant with you to fear you and love you all the days of my life. Right here, right now. And now, You can take your hand off your heart. You can lift your hand to the heavens. You can say to the Lord, Come. Come, bring me back to life. Bring that southern part back to life. Cause me to be. Cause me to yield in fear of God. Cause me to yield in love. And now, be lifted high. Right here. And now be glorified, God of heaven and earth, God who brought me back to life, I am yours forever, yours. I am yours, I am yours forever, yours. This is your covenant, church. 
I am yours forever yours. Father, today we declare, I belong to you. I am yours. This is not just a love song. This is a covenant. I'm cutting covenant with you right here, right now. I am yours. You own me. I belong to you. And because I declare and swear my full allegiance to you, I shall follow you and fear you and love you and honour you and worship you and serve you all the days of my life. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn His face to shine upon you and be gracious, abundantly gracious to you. May the Lord turn His countenance toward you, acknowledge you, see you, validate you, and give you shalom. And all of God's people, shout aloud, Amen. Come on church, all of God's people, shout aloud, Amen. Let's praise God, let's give God a praise.